I am Jeff Foxworthy and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody, here we are, West Point, Mississippi, home of Mossy Oak, and it's uh, beginning to feel like spring the is coming, guys. are chirping this morning, that's for sure. I'm seeing daffodils blooming, Toxie. Oh, Toxic. my gosh, just don't talk about it. Just so <laughs> He's ready to get I'm out ready of here already. I'll elope well, from the world. Well, you made a point a little earlier that you, you don't want the spring to get here quite as fast as it seems like it's coming. I, I don't, personally. I, mean, I, I, I especially don't like... All of this, we've had like 70 in January and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. then a bunch of cold weather and then warm again. I mean, I would prefer, and I think Dave echoed that too, a little bit later. Yeah, we're re- we're recording this on February 7th. And on my drive this morning, I'm already seeing elms trying to flower. I'm seeing red maples yeah. already trying to flower. That's a sign of it being early. That's true. Yeah. I remember it snowing in March at one point, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not the biologist, but it obviously has a lot to do with the amount of sunlight that they take in on top of the temperature, swaying it a little bit. But uh, I just don't like it when it's upside down, you know. Too early, then cold, then, you know, and then we've had all this warm weather early, and then the last couple, I mean, I was talking about the opening day I went with, Rob last year, and I mean, I like to froze to death. It was like twenty four, mm-hmm. and it want, was turkeys all down where we went, and we never heard one peep. We just want a normal year. <clears throat> Lanny and I had an opening day when you. you it it oh, was yeah. very cold. I had a down jacket on. You could see your breath, <clears throat> and yeah, they you could gobbled see the like breath. crazy. <sighs> you could. Hey, Coming Dave, out through that bottom. Hey, Dave, I got a memory. They were uh, hammering in the opening day in Alabama, though, weren't they? Oh yeah. This year they were for sure. <laughs> yep. yep. Well, we got to we got to we got to break bread together in the woods last spring. It was pretty special. So it let's go cool. and, let's let's introduce our guest. We have got and we're, this is long overdue. Oh, this we, is we've we wanted to have him for a long time and and it just hadn't worked out, but now we've got Dave Owens. Sound the horns. Yep. The <laughs> Penhody project. Dave, project. We're we're excited to have you on and ask you a bunch of questions. <laughs> Well, it was a pleasure pleasure uh, receiving the invite from you guys. I kind of, my feelings have kind of been hurt, honestly. It's been, it's been so long. <laughs> I Man, know. I've been, I've been, well, I've been on I'll, every 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 other podcast, but I haven't been invited on this. One. Not to kick dirt on my blood brother, cuz, but he covets your podcast <laughs> appearances so much. I just, I think we wanted to stand back a little bit from that. But it's time because I was safe from <laughs> spending time with you, especially in the woods. Not actually part of that spend time in the woods was just visiting and stuff, which is very cool, too. He is a gamekeeper through and through. And we, we did make one attempt at you, but it was during deer season, and you were busy chasing that crazy-looking, tall, <laughs> eight-point-looking thing. You hook, hook daddy or yeah. whoever it was hook you got. Daddy. Uh, yeah, well, as a matter of fact, when you reached out to me, I think I was laying down in the back of the truck, sitting at the end of truck stop. <laughs> there you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> The hardcore lifestyle. Yeah, Big time. Get, get a little rest. Well, I'm glad to know Dudley did that because I talked to him several times and I got the vibe that uh, he had dropped the ball there. But Oh, but, come on now. For, you know, Dudley is uh, – well, Dudley's Dudley. and uh, Is he really? It, well, he, <laughs> what up? I hope know, y'all no, are okay with that. Were never, you, did you study philosophy and talk? <laughs> That's right. Like, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty so, much. Yeah. So, look – Dave, if you'll hang on with us just one second, we got to pay the bills here. We've got a sponsor, LS Tractor, that likes we do the blood on the biologic segment oh, every yeah. week. And, uh, you know, we'll fix it, but we'll be, talk, be talking a lot about turkeys. There'll be a lot yep. of youth, I hope. Oh, yeah. Have turkeys, but opens first. There is uh, one young lady, her name is Morgan Stevens, and she killed a young buck with a bow and arrow. Oh, nice. That's awesome. By herself. That's her dad awesome. was sitting a few trees away watching the whole thing, and uh, his his name is Tony, and they did the the hashtag blood on the biologic like I'm trying to, you know, we're trying to get everybody to do. So they did it. And so we're going to give a shout out to Morgan. Heck yeah. I've got, I've got a blood on the biologic. It was pretty phenomenal. Actually. 
I understand Bobby Cole broke the ice on his ducks for the year on the last right. afternoon oh, yeah. of the season. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Did y'all shoot him at night again? Finally got an invite. <laughs> right I, the- I, Bobby, you've been invited and you've turned me down. As the sun was setting. Yeah, our, but it was actually, incredible. We Dave, saw a lot of ducks. So you know they changed our duck season this year. We got only two weeks. Because it's literally, we got – Water oh. finally with about three weeks this left, and a day later it froze four inches thick mm-hmm. everywhere, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. took a week to thaw. So we had about two weeks worth. And that We're was it. But the good year. news is, they still come down here. Yeah, that was Thank the mo- the, the yeah. mother nature duck season Ooh. only lasted yeah. two weeks. Yeah, yeah. The and dra- I, the drought of the century. And I so still- that that blood on the biologics to me just as big as a big deer or turkey something too. Yeah. God's choice out there I know I still love to shoot them Lanny it, it a sure lot of fun. is fun so I gotta tell this to everybody out there we're sitting there and it's a bluebird afternoon but not you know this is a place we don't bother at all and we had a lot of ducks I knew we would at least kill a few and so um, sat there a little bit and some came the wind wasn't just right for where we had set up but I knew it wouldn't be a lot of wind and we could get around it some and the trees right there were hiding and weren't very tall so anyway finally I think it was a great duck. Swung around and cupped up real pretty, and then boom, Bobby just smokes him. It's real quiet for a second, and then I hear Bobby. I can barely hear him mumbling. He said, "I don't really know what taking drugs is like, but if it's anything like that, <laughs> I'm glad I never <laughs> tried them." In trouble. <laughs> it is so much fun to shoot. I love it. So, it, well, so right back at you though. But uh, blood on the biologic. Didn't you? Uh, you killed a, a really nice deer in the I last did, few I, weeks. I did. Mm-hmm. I did. Guess what? The season's still open in Alabama. Oh yeah. We got until Saturday, and I've got the guest or two coming. Our buddy Michael Hunter, his wife. Be in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. South and wind. Well, the does so. better look out when he shows up. Yeah. So, but yeah, I did. I killed a deer, of course, with my bow. It's probably hundred. I mean, it's about one hundred fifty inch. Hmm. That's Ooh, nice. Quick. Eleven point. Yeah. Main Notice frame. he mentions inches when he's talking. If I had meant, if I said hundred, I said he'd about. Like, I didn't score it. I'm just so people know about what it would be. It just it wasn't uh, like massive or anything. But it was a deer I had pictures of and had seen. Uh, and I, quite honestly, the truth story is during Christmas um, when we were down there hunting. That was kind of the first time I got to go much this year. I took a shot. And it was late when I took it. I could see good, but anyway, I hit this deer and I could hear crack. And I knew I'd hit it in the shoulder, but you know, a lot of times you still kill them. But we looked for four hours. I never found one drop of blood, the error or anything. So I just assumed I hit him really high, you know, and uh, ended up, turns out it was this deer. So, and I didn't know that until I recovered him, but he had a hole at the very top of his shoulder, right in the shoulder, high in it. I mean, obviously it didn't go in, must not have gone in far at all. Um, but he had a stripe down that side about an inch or two wide that was just gray and no hair. It had gotten infected. And so he wasn't limping and looking bad. He'd lost some weight, but I feel like he might not have lived. And so I was so glad that I killed him. The other mm-hmm. thing was when I got to him, there were no horns on his head. And I was like, what Oh, but there are horns the on his head when you shot him. And I, well, at the same <laughs> – honestly, you know, I'm getting old now. I thought we did – my memory that bad <laughs> and i can't remember horns and like so i i didn't see any horns where he crashed and so i backed down the blood trail it was a great blood trail and i found one and i went back all up and down and all around and i couldn't find the, and i said i know he had both sides i know he did am i going crazy and i rolled him back and he was laying on top of the other one hmm. so i got I both of them and then tom who works for us who does taxidermy work now too he glued them on, back on the pedicle overnight and they Took pictures the next day, so I got to take pictures of it, and he's gonna mount it. Glued them on there, Lanny. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Tom Just is get some versatile. gorilla glue. Oh, yeah. he's, no, he's, Tom's he, a man. He's really doing good at his yeah. taxidermy yeah, too. Yeah. So, so it was fun. I got to this, you know, another year. I've got to kill one with a bow. Heck I, yeah, yeah. Congrats. It I never, like it, it never gets old. No, it yeah. never does get old. Yep. for sure. So, a deer that's got infection like that. Would you eat that deer? What would you eat one side? Of, how, how do you, you know, handle that? I, Tom. That's the saddest thing. He said, you just can't take a chance, disinfection, because it, it was it was a lot of pus coming out of the mm. Yum. Old wound and stuff. And I just, I hate it. Yeah. But no. No, I know you That's yeah, what I, broke But my I'm heart just trying to educate people. I, I can't sure. stand to waste one gram of wild game meat at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't. But, but that, you can't take a chance either. Dave, would you have known not to eat that deer? That if, if, I, I, I'm just trying to educate people. I wouldn't have known that. Well, you have to eyeball it first. This was a bad infection. I mean, when you see all the hair had come off down that side, 
and that skin was kind of dying down through there, the infection has spread a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, funny you mentioned that I had killed the deer that I'd killed in Kentucky. I think it was a uh, year before last. Um, when I, when I killed the deer, it, there was no apparent injuries or nothing seemed to be wrong with the deer. <clears throat> then when we, um, uh, when I cut him open, there was like just behind, uh, I think it was kind of up around the neck area. I was cutting him open and there was just like a lot of infection and you couldn't even see it from the outside because there was no apparent wound or whatnot. And I was like, man, it just doesn't make sense as to, as to where this is coming from. And then, um, uh, you know, you have to, um, had to take the, you know, when you, when you leave, leaving, leaving Kentucky, I had to like, you know, debone everything. Oh, yeah. So I had to yep. cut the, cut, get the meat off the bone and everything. So I took the neck roast and kind of cut it off and just had a big lump of, uh, of meat. And as I was deboning it, getting the bone out of it, I found an arrow shaft, about six inches of arrow shaft in the, in the base of the deer's neck. Mm. And, um, wow. Which made sense now as a word, the infection came from, even though it wasn't apparent from the outside, couldn't even find the little bitty, uh, entry hole or anything, but, uh, it begged the question whether the, the meat throughout the whole animal was at risk because of that infection that I found below the skin there, but we, we ate it and yep. we're still here. So I guess we're all right. I guess we're, I guess would we have, made it I out just, on the other side. Yeah, I cannot stand the waste. And I would think it would be fine cooking. And Tom, who works for me, he's been around that a long time. In fact, he even worked at a, a meat processing mm -hmm. place before too. And he looked at me and he said, and I said, no, surely not. I mean, not right there, but the hams and the tenderloins. He said, no, you. I'm sorry, boss, you cannot eat this deer. So yeah, he was really. so sure of it. it. It was bad. It wasn't contained in one area. I think you just have yeah. to take I it just on hate a case, to talk about by case basis. Even know. to the world that you would not eat one. But when you get down to something like that, it's just like, is there a risk or not? And so. Yeah, you can't take a risk take like a that. Risk. For sure. It depends. Lanny, have you got a blood on the biological? Yeah, I do. It's actually White and Patton McGarity, two young men from West Point. Brandon McGarity. Yeah. Guy, a local guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure did. Myers killed his first deer. I think it was on, he said Dr. Miller, so I'm assuming that's Ned. That's probably, yes. Probably, They're big buddies. Yeah. yeah. Hunt together. And right. then his other one, uh, his other son, Patton, killed a killed a 10 point. So. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, Brandon, yeah. Little gamekeepers out there getting it done. Yep. Awesome. I've got a first duck here. Uh, Wade Luke, son of Betsy and Caleb Luke. Uh, they live around here. Y'all, y'all yeah. have met Caleb. Mm -hmm. I think he yeah. kind of sort of hunts near the dummy line, doesn't uh, he? Bobby? What is this? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, why yeah. does this keep coming uh, up? I mean, I've got <laughs> what is the deal. Yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, Wade got his first duck. It's a wood duck. So, congrats to you. Congratulations. Him. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. So that's brought to you by LS Tractor. See these people. When the clock strikes five, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. They have to do these things. They have to do those things. Enter the all-new LS Tractor MT2 and MT2E, a relentless force of innovation. Redesigned with a new hood and cab built for comfort and visibility, with enhanced lifting capacity to get the job done. Making these people the ones everyone else calls those people. Visit your local LS Tractor dealer today. Moultrie was first in feeders since 1979 and is the leader in total game management. They're taking feeding to another level with the new Ranch Series line of durable and versatile feeders perfect for both wildlife and domestic livestock. So Dudley, you can feed your goats. Whether you're a deer hunter, a hobby farmer, a land manager, or a rancher, Moultrie has you covered with several kit options including a rotating auger, broadcast, or a gravity kit. And these feeders are 300 or 450 pounds. They're big feeders. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site-wide discount at MoultriefEaters.com. Use the code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount. Dave, we are really excited to have you here for sure. I'm going to throw out the first question. We're going to ask you a, a bunch of questions. and But right off the bat, I want to ask you, we just Dudley just mentioned the the Lanny and I and Toxie have got a property that we turkey hunt and and like I said I, we've lost a lot of sleep with our neighbors on one side and we wake <laughs> up one day last year and hear that you're hunting with them <laughs> and I just want to ask one question did they ever say 
Hey, we we can't go over there. <laughs> we can't go across that. This is the property line. Did you ever hear Did anything you ever run like into that? The property line. It's all clear now, Dave. Why you're actually even on the podcast today? <laughs> this is an entire. Uh, there, yeah, there you was, ever had a, a, one, Has the FBI ever was, interrogated you before? I mean, it's what it's going to feel like here in another. There minute. was just one area they said you need to walk down the center. Don't walk into tire tracks. Walk down the center in the pine oh, straw. Here stay we in go. the pine straw. Here, here we go. Rut, rut row. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's fine. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> that's what I've been worried about all this time. And then he posted a video this past week on his Instagram page, and I recognize those little small tree pine trees. Oh pine yeah, trees that's the only place now. in America with small pine trees on it, Bobby. You're right. Pine <laughs> pine the paranoia begins. It does. Wow. I don't. That's the only place in America I found small pine trees like that to grow turkeys too. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. It turkeys, is the ugliest point. place in the world <laughs> to is. have great turkey on. It really is. It really it's is amazing. <laughs> It is. And you can sit down and not see six feet because yeah. it's so thick in yep. places. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, they're probably making a lot of baby turkeys there. Yep. Well, so the clear cuts are it, the key. It may know, not look as like, as they are. It may yeah, not look no like it. textbook spring turkey woods, but gosh, if a bunch of uh, poults are making it to adulthood, then you're going to have turkeys a, to hunt. We've I talked won't. about that before. you gotta, you yeah. got to hatch them. Yeah. Actually, be better – Habitat for raising them than big open woods everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Back in the day, didn't your dad, Mr. Fox, didn't mm-hmm. he hunt at a club called the Blue Door or nope. something? The Blue Room. Why would what, you bring it up? I, I don't know. I just you would... couldn't have known it unless I told you. No, you did tell yeah. me. Yeah. So there was a man, uh, Mr. Roof Lehman, who worked with him at Bryan and Sir Lee, uh, and his dad, and Mr. Louie, I think his name was. But anyway, that was a pretty famous little block up area but well, that's, that's the flatwoods of kemper county and they had turkeys there when i didn't air it down anyway <laughs> they had turkeys when you know there were just a few places that had any turkeys back in say the 60s 50s i mean where i grew up hunting with daddy because he was from mobile was one of the probably the highest population in the whole country and where they hung on when they almost went extinct but there was a little population right in there always and so i remember going as a little kid oh I, I wasn't old enough to even take a gun to hunt yet Hmm. But and we heard a turkey or two, and uh, that place was called uh, the Blue Room, and they had a, you had to drive about five or six miles through the woods, mud roads, winch in with you know a bronco and all that stuff, and then uh, no electricity or anything to stay there. But it was a cool. They had a couple hundred acres out there in the middle of all that warehouse land. I wonder if that is that still intact? You think? I think it is. I think it is. His uh, so there's Mr. Louis Layman and then Mr. Roof Layman who lived here in West Point, a great man. Worked with Daddy for a very, very long time. And then his son, and he was a forester, I believe, too. And I think he still has that in there. But it would be mm-hmm. probably, I'm going to say, four or five miles to your west. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little northwest even, somewhere <clears throat> in that world. But it's just like a big wilderness area down through there for maybe 20, 30, 40 miles. Yeah, it is. A lot of pine trees. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing but. It's one of the few places you can go and, and you're in the middle of the woods and you just sit and listen and you cannot hear a, a, a beep of human existence. Yep. Yeah. No, nothing. Nope. But yep. the wind. Yep. Yeah. Or less. Yep. And hopefully a- it's quiet. <laughs> so, Dave, I'm going to start off with that. That that first one was my. I'm just checking the box on that one, and I'll lose sleep over your answer there for a long for a lot of nights coming up. But my first uh, turkey hunting question, I want to ask you. It, let's talk first about. I want to get your opinion, your thoughts on the fly down cackle. I mm. think a lot of people don't use it enough. A lot of people may use it too much. Some people don't use it at all. I would just kind of like to start the conversation right there. I think that's one of those that's, that's up for, for interpretation on from hen to hen. I think we've all probably set up under them and had them fly down and not make a sound. And then I think, uh, I know for me, it's always, uh, if I'm going to hear a cackle, it's usually when everything's elevated that morning, like a lot of, vo- you know, vocalization. Hens are really back and forth with each other. Um, I'll use it from time to time as far as calling to a turkey if I'm really trying to ramp his uh his mood up if i'm trying to get him overly excited or if i've already got him ramped up and i'm trying to keep that uh, intensity level really high um that's one of the things that uh i think a hen does i don't think she if she's going to be uh you know somewhat um quiet that morning i don't think she's just out of the blue going to do a fly down cackle i mean maybe she could i mean i don't think any of us have the rule book on on turkeys but um it's typically uh we we 
friends and I have this discussion when, you know, that's part of the competition calling thing is a fly down cackle. They want to hear a fly down cackle. We're always just like, well, I wonder how it would score if you just took a wing and clucked about three times and then just did a wing beat because probably nine out of 10 hens, that's the way they, that's the way they fly down. That's, that's their quote unquote cackle is just a couple quick clucks and, and a bunch of wing beats and, and, and shaking pine limbs. But um, yeah, I think, if I'm going to do a fly down cackle, it's because I'm trying to keep that uh, intensity level up um, and trying to keep, you know, keep that uh, enthusiasm up through the morning and keep everybody talkative. I would say ditto, ditto every word you said for me. And it's like, also I would, and I think you'd agree. It's also, if you kind of have the feeling you got to really compete for this, it makes a little bit of difference then, you know, and that gets when it's real noisy. There's a lot of hens being mean, I feel the need to have to compete for him a little bit more you know, than I would otherwise. Mm. Just kind of uh, adding to that is the little technique that I do a lot of times, especially when you're talking about when you're in there, there's a competition and you're having to compete with other hens that are on the limb is I always try to get the gobbler on the ground first so I can manipulate him a little bit before the hens get to the ground. And so sometimes if I'm trying to paint that picture, there's a girl already on the ground and I, you know, sometimes a fly down cackle will kind of paint that picture a little better, possibly get him on the ground and I can manipulate him, get him to, you know, move toward me 50 or 60, 70 yards before the hens hit the ground. So I'm trying to paint that picture to kind of get him on the ground as quick as possible to, so I can kind of turn his gears without having, having all the interference from, from the ladies. So that fly down cackle that you were mentioning, that is one of those things that could help, help let him know that there's a girl on the ground. It seems like they make all that noise and chatter earlier in the season than later. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you hear all that all that chatter when they're about to fly out of the tree and flying down. Uh, but later on in the season, it, it just seems like they're just going to tuck their wings and, and go to the ground. Yeah, they will, but it's a lot less, mm -hmm. a lot less. Yep. I look, you know, it seems like there's one or two mornings a year when you just hear all kind of, and I've always heard, what's the term that the, the, the Turkey Jubilee. Yes. Yeah, yeah, That's but, what daddy but, used to use that word. So I used it one time. Yeah, and it, what is that? Yeah, well, um, I want some of that. That's more of a <laughs> that's more of a reference to the the uh, fisheries around yeah, Mobile. You know, no, you no, have no, a, but it's like, like yeah. a, it's yeah. like for him, it's like a crescendo. I mean, I used to do like I'd have a push button in each hand and the mouth call between all of that. You can make it sound like five or six hens. Mm -hmm. And he kid, he said, "My dang son, there just put on a jubilee." Uh, you know, and it was like to him, it's like when you hear, like he's talking about a bunch of hens. Yeah cutting back and forth at each other and, you know, fly down, cackle, and everybody's all excited. And then that's what he just came up with the word jubilee for. That's it. a cool mm -hmm. term. And uh, a lot of our listeners probably don't know where that word comes from. But, you know, if you're from the Gulf Coast, specifically yeah. closer to Mobile, there's a phenomenon they call a jubilee. Yep. Um, I've actually heard that it happens on the exact opposite side of the planet. In Japan, um, I think it is. But uh, you can literally ride around in your boat or, or walk along the shore, and there'll be like trout and flounder and crabs, crabs and shrimp. Everything. shrimp. everything like comes to the surface and comes shallower, and it's like they're they're crazy and dumb. And so, well, I think they about decided it was a it's kind of a flip of the oxygen level. Mm -hmm. It only happens in the summers, and especially they, you On know when tide. it's been really yeah, yeah. Well, when it's been dry for a while, and the and the bays are like real salty and stuff. But then. When it starts, I remember being there before, and my friend that lived there, we went to see him on the way home from the coast, and he said, it's looking like a jubilee to me. And I looked out on the piers, and there was like crabs at the top of the water on all the posts and stuff like that. And he told me later, when we left, it was a massive one. And people are just yelling, screaming, jubilee, jubilee, yeah, jubilee. Everybody go get your nets. Yeah, and they went nets <laughs> and ice boxes and are just filling up mm. coolers <laughs> with seafood, you know. Okay, let's get let's get back to Turkey. Well, but there was a I guy named Mike Batty that had a recording oh. back in the day that was called Turkey Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was a, it was just a crescendo of, 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 of Turkey. And he and he said it would happen a couple of times every spring. Mm. That, that, I'm just referencing back twenty or thirty years when he was explaining. But I remember listening to it, and it was just it was crazy. But well, it, it's a it's a marvelous great sound in the spring but i dave you i yield to you on every turkey thing there is but it's not the greatest sound to think you're going to have call one right in right yeah not if it's a whole <laughs> you know, bunch of them. competition's not a great thing i'd rather i'd rather hear it in the fall when i'm in a deer stand here and i'm going back and forth like that <laughs> correct 
Yeah, well, that that does make a lot of sense. What? Well, so, Lanny, what have you got a quote you want to start I, I, with? I'm on fire, just like you did, but I, in not in reference to the fly down cackle, but uh, to uh, tree yelp. Shoot, man, I use that just about every every flipping morning. That's that's part of the biggest. Uh, if she's not going to do anything else, she's going to tree yelp to get his attention. Mm-hmm. And I feel like uh, it typically sometimes it'll tree yelp will be beginning to end for me because if he's excited enough about the tree yelping, then that's all he'll get. Um, I'm one of those, uh, which is, uh, you may not believe it watching my videos. Cause I like to call to them, but unless is more like if I've got him fooled, then I'll just seal the deal right there. Um, but if he's a, uh, if he's on top of tree yelping, then that's a lot of times that's kind of all he'll get. Hmm. Well, so Dave, sometimes do you ever sit there and you're like, okay, I'm going to softly tree and you'll yelp tree yelp to him, but he doesn't gobble. Then you're thinking, I don't think he heard that. Maybe I need to do it just a little bit louder. <laughs> Every morning. <laughs> just, yeah. I'll tell you what. The There's question. no way he's not gobbling at it. Yeah. The longer I hunt, whatever, 50-something years, the more I am amazed that they yeah. can hear the lightest yelp in it. Whatever. Look at them old. physiologically. I mean, their eardrums. Well, are I know, but it's like, right but you, unmistakably, I've always said, well, I got to hit it a little bit more mm. to for yeah. him to cut me. You know, because sudden sounds will make them gobble. There's nothing necessarily magic about that, but uh, it's crazy how far they can hear that little light yipping, Dave. I mean, oh, it's it is. oh for sure, absolutely. Especially well, right I was morning. with you. The turkey was. We're calling for Daniel, and uh, gosh, I mean, one of the turkeys was probably 300 plus yards and I was sitting with Dave listening to him this the most beautiful soft yapping you have ever heard and but I could barely hear it and the turkey was just hammering every note you know so they could it's amazing one thing you do that's really cool that I've always done so you know when you hunt with someone like Dave it's as good as there is and they do something you did makes you you know Put your oh, thumbs yeah. in the <laughs> I love no, I to yelp too. I love to yelp a single the only other person I ever heard really do it much was Bob hmm. I love to yelp a single note. You did that all the time while we were hunting. It would just be yelp, and that's it. Mm-hmm. No prow, 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 not even three or four notes, a single note yelp. And I love to do that myself. Now, I might come back in maybe five or six seconds and do a few notes behind it, but just a single yelp. And I've just heard hens do it a lot. I don't think, to me, there's nothing magic about it other than it sounds realistic and other people don't do it much. But mm-hmm. talk about that, because you did that quite a bit more than I've ever heard anybody. And I can I can remember this exact instant when that happened to me when I watched it happen and it started provoking a turkey to gobble that had kind of went cold. Um, it was me and my, my buddy uh, Sam Hunt actually. He's you know he's a big country music star now, but he and I were, we grew up together and graduated high school together. We were on a piece of property of his grandparents and we had a turkey up on a ridge above us gobbling. You know, and we were down there calling too much, calling too loud, and it had him hung up on the ridge up there. He was probably a hundred. 50 yards or so from us and we were on a little old red dirt road little two-track road down there and we were yelping to him and he done went cold because uh for whatever reason by that time we hear a hen coming you know he done went cold hadn't gobbled in i don't know 20 or 30 minutes and she came walking up right there beside us and she got up there and was you know kind of got content and she started doing that she was clucking a purr and she'd do a single note yelp just yelp. and just you know she'd scratch and whatever and a little bit and, and buddy, he hadn't gobbled in 30 minutes or more. And suddenly he just started gobbling again. And I took note of that. I thought, huh. Mm. And I'd yelp a little bit. He wouldn't do anything. And she would just stop and she'd, oh, oh he'd gobble at it. I thought that, that has stuck in my mind since that day. <laughs> I thought that turkey had done went completely cold and had turned off. The, his switch had turned off. She got down there and just, just being a turkey. She wasn't being aggressive. She wasn't even kind of really. Uh, competing for his attention and she could it almost it was like she could take it or leave it you know mm. um, but her little that little single note yelp and I took note of that and uh, that's kind of a lot of times I know a lot of people frown on it but when I'm walking through the woods then my mentality is I'm walking through the woods if I get with an eyesight of a turkey I'm gonna scare him anyways so I'm always sounding like a turkey walking through the woods single note yelping clucking and purring and stuff to try to provoke him to gobble before I get in eyesight of him and that's one of those things that I do I'll, I'll kick the ground and do a little clucking and purring and that single note yelp I can't tell you how many times I've gotten gotten the, their gears to turn and again with just uh almost acting like you can't hear them almost ignoring the turkey ignoring him gobbling and, and, and the ruckus that he's putting on and acting like you're just out there on a little island by yourself and those single note yelps is one of those things that I think paints that picture Playing hard to get. 
Mm. I have. I've had. You ain't good at that. I've, I've had young ladies all my life before I got married. <laughs> played hard to get one. I hear him. I'm, 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 I'm with him. I don't. You know, we don't. Re- I mean, if, if someone knows how they think, it's probably Dave. But I mean, we really don't know how they think. But I always get the feeling. Just I guess some stuff is just built up of so many years of being out there with them, and then you know, what, especially something that doesn't work and doesn't work and doesn't work. But I always kind of call it it's time to play the quiet game, which, you know, a little bit of that's kind of let's play hard to get to. But you better you better get you a double shot of patience to do the <laughs> hard to get, play the quiet game hunt too. You can't be compulsive, got to hammer down on them, got to make them, you know, cut out of You know, you got to really back down and be a super patient person. But it is, you'll kill, I, I my opinion, you'll kill a lot of turkeys that would have been hard to kill or, you know, Otherwise. So, Dave, do you have two different mindsets? Do you have a mindset going on to a private property uh, where you're trying to call turkeys off the neighboring property? Probably, I would expect. (laughs) (laughs) And and then another mindset, if you're on public ground, the way you would call to a turkey. Not calling to a turkey. I just I feel like a turkey's a turkey. I think uh, they 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 all work the same way. Uh, the way I may approach the turkey is a little bit different. I think I think the location you're using to to call to the turkey to try to draw him into is more important than than probably what you're saying a lot of times when it comes to private versus public. Um, obviously, if I'm going to public ground, I'm trying to get the turkeys that have been called to less. I don't know if you're going to find one that hadn't been called to, but uh, try to find the corners of the property uh, that uh, harder to get to. You know. Th- standard stuff trying to find the turkeys that have been uh been boogered a little a little less but as far as my approach um not really i, I kind of go to to yelp into a turkey the same way regardless of uh where his address is <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to you know try to set up in a spot that that you think they're going to want to be at anyway you know that's yeah. that's real important especially when you can't go across that fence you know, you're, you're stuck on that one side of the fence. You may as well pick a good spot to holler at them from. Yeah. Well, we've, a number of people have said that, that, you know, where you sit, finally where you find in that place to sit down. Everything. The most important yeah. part. Yep. Set up is everything. Yeah. That's one of my hardest things to do. Yeah. You know, the, the ADD in me, I'll say, oh, what about that tree that's 10 yards away? Or what if he comes in? You know, yeah. I may spend 20 minutes yeah. trying to figure out what tree to sit on. Honestly, that's least. such a big, to my detriment. That's such a big deal to me. I could even say, with a lot of honesty, that's part of the reason we're even here today. All of us yeah. is that the birth of Mossy Oak was so much about us, so insecure about being spotted by turkeys. I mean, because it was bad, and so I mean, other, the only answer to that was build this massive blind everywhere you went too. So yeah, that's always a big thing to me. But setting up is. I mean, Dave, you speak to setting up is as big a part of the strategy, probably more to the success than anything you'll do. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, Dudley from Gamekeepers here. I want to tell you about the all new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed. For everywhere and i think people laughed at us when we started carrying a video camera around all the time um we were staring at that video camera and they're like ah, y'all y'all over analyze the setup to like the nth degree and i was like because i feel like that is the most important part especially when you hunt like we do obviously we don't we don't use decoys very often at, or we don't use decoys at all and we i lose them and so like when he gets in shotgun range it, it, you need to be hidden, but at the same time, he needs to be in shotgun range before you lay your eyes on him. So right, having exactly. that set up, yes, having, having the setup just right so that every, all that comes together, it's just all those super small little pieces of the puzzle that have to be, have to be put in place in order to make the, the hunt successful. Um, that's just why, you know, when it comes to the setup, uh, we've said that you can have the prettiest hen yelp and, and you can be on the best dirt in the world, but if you don't know where to sit down where that turkey wants to come to, it's really hard to kill him. Mm. No, and you know what? I always feel a lot of pressure when you're trying to – because, like, if you're moving in on a turkey and he's gobbling, you just feel like you've got to hurry up and sit down somewhere. Yeah, you don't want to get seen. And you got that evil sun shining on you too, which cuts you out of about 
fifty percent of the trees mm-hmm. you want to sit on. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. too. That's that leads to other things like if you can possibly locate one without having you at him yet. Mm. I just think to me, cause once you, the, you know, like we, we did that later in the day in the Turkey Oval and I was like meters ticking and we were panicking, get down, get down. It could, you know, and so once you make them hen call to them to make them gobble, I feel like that the clock has started Yeah, and you don't have all that time. If you make one with a crow call or something, up in the morning, then you're like, oh, let's look around, let's be sure. You know, if he comes here, let's back up a little bit. You know, you can be more strategic, take your time to do what he's talking about. But sometimes, if it's up in the morning, you don't have any time. Yeah. You better hit the dirt. You know. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of trying to pick your brain here. What's the one thing that you feel like you gotta have every time you you, you sit down? A uh, perfect scenario, I guess, is is what we're trying to talk about here. I guess for me, perfect scenario is. Um, you always want to be in the shade, like you just mentioned. I like to have a little cover, obviously, behind you. Um, but just as important to me is something in front of you to break up those, you know, those rigid outlines of of, of the body, of the legs that you got propped up there. Um, I'm a big, you know, I like to do the uh, the leafy jacket stuff to kind of try to break up that outline. I, I don't know. It's probably more just a mind game than anything else, just a confidence factor. Um, and um uh, but yeah, I think the shadows. I think you can get away with a lot if you're in some dark shadows, which is what I always try to try to uh, try to target when I'm looking for the perfect setup. But um, like I just mentioned, also to me, the perfect setup is the turkey's in shotgun range by the time he starts. Yeah. And especially since I've started introducing a camera to every flipping thing, which you guys know about, I mean, that glass <laughs> on that camera is hard to hide. Yeah. I mean, and you can't put nothing in front of the glass or it defeats the whole purpose So the glass on that camera is hard to hide. So um, if you don't have anything out there to dis- distract that turkey, like a decoy or whatnot, and he's looking for you and he stares into the, to the glass lens of that camera, a lot of times it, it makes for a quick departure. So when he's in shotgun range uh, is the best place for him to show up. Mac, have you got a question? <clears throat> what uh, what do you think about like tactics in different areas in the southeast versus the Midwest versus the far west or down in Florida? I mean, are you are you looking at <clears throat> similar features on a map? Uh, you know, creeks, roost trees, things things like that, or and, and then your calling tactics. Do they differ in each you know region for each species or subspecies? Yeah, you kind of kind of tailor uh, you tailored your uh, the tactics to wherever you're at. Um, but it was it as it comes down, it can be broken down into a million different little into little sectors. But as far as finding turkeys, to me, it's always the limiting factor. You're trying to find whatever's got that turkey bottleneck down. Like when you go out west, a lot of times that's roost trees. That's what they you know their their life revolves around a roost tree. Um, in the southeast, like Florida, for instance, a lot of times that can be dry ground. So all depending on the year. So you kind of have to find that limiting factor as to what's going to have the turkeys uh, narrowed down. I mean, as far as yelping and, and, and not a whole lot, there is a little bit of difference when it comes to say Miriam's and Rio's when it comes to the comparing them to Easterns and Osceola's, but that more or less has to do in my opinion that those turkeys, uh, obviously all turkeys survive with their eyes, but the Easterns and Osceola's have to trust their ears a little bit more um, because the, uh, uh, the great expanses to use their eyes to their advantage isn't there. You know, a lot of them live in a lot thicker uh, ground, especially Osceola's. Um, so they have to trust their ears a little bit more. Um, so I think they listen a little bit more intently uh, to what you're telling them. And uh, when it comes to out West, when you're yelping to a turkey out West, a lot of times, in my opinion, it's it's just as important or more important. You always hear the, hear the telltale that do not yelp to a turkey that you can see. Like if he can, if he can see you, you don't need to be yelping to him. Um, uh, cause he can pinpoint you. And I think those turkeys, um, live with their eyes so much. I've yelped to a lot of Miriam turkeys, you know, at 70 yards and have them stand there, uh, because it's just like they, they trust their eyes in that open terrain and they've dealt with that so much, um, is when you yelp to them, I've watched them almost get plumb just beside themselves spooky and turn around and walk off because that open terrain, they're just able to, to pin it. And uh, they're just used to having that that ability to see whatever it is they're, they're chasing. Yeah, it makes it fun when you can go out there and you can hunt them in some kind of timber and cover stuff a lot more mm-hmm. than the, the wide open spaces. It's tough. You maybe catch a ridge, you know, where they got to get, you know, you can shoot to the top of the ridge or something like that. But it's tough. He's mm. dead on about that. Mm. 
I love finding them in the ponderosas, those big ponderosas. Yes, I'd much rather hunt them. I'd much rather hunt them in the big trees than, than that open stuff for sure. I've got one more, Dave. What's the most common food source you've seen cleaning a turkey all over the United States? Oh man, it's corn. I don't care. I don't care if you're in the center of a 10 million acre uh, national forest. They say somehow them turkeys find corn in them. It's a funny thing. Interesting how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Moon acorns, a friend of mine called them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Wow. Wow. So, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. It sounds like you kind of grew up and got bit by the turkey bug pretty young. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before anybody else around me, I was, uh, before I could drive, I was, I was eat up with turkeys for some reason. My dad was a deer hunter and a small game hunter. And we, uh, were raised in the woods. Um, I became infatuated with turkeys and I don't know why. Um, I don't know if it was the vocalization or whatnot. I was always that kid that if I heard an owl or a crow or a morning dove or whatever, I could always just mimic it and just kind of fool the, fool the animal. I remember sitting on the back porch and that had, my dad had a bird feeder out there and I would, I would take my hands and, and coo like a morning dove and I'd have them come landing on the, uh, the ridge of the house and stuff. And so I was always that kid that could just hear something and just mimic it. So obviously I just felt, you know, turkeys just fell right into my wheelhouse and, um, picked up those, you know, yelpers every time they put them on clearance at Walmart and just lived with one in my mouth all the time, just yelping and making whatever sound. And, um, just, God, yeah, I just fell into the, the infatuation with turkeys as soon as I got out there with them and got to hear them and go back and forth and the dialogue and everything. And, uh, you know, we, uh, chased them around. I got, uh, I guess I was probably 12 or 13 years old when my, when my mom, we moved out to the country and had a little place. And that, you know, when you were that old, you had a four wheeler and you didn't know what a property line was and nobody really cared. You were a young kid, you know? So we just went, if we found turkeys, we would, we would go hunt turkeys. And so that's kind of where I got, uh, just eight, I get, I guess bit with a bug as you would say. Yeah. Um, and then from there, uh, once you got those wheels up under you and you can move, man, that's when, that's when things really started taking flight. And then, when I started traveling, I guess that was probably early in college. I started traveling freshman year of college. I started traveling to hunt turkeys and then everything just kind of ballooned from there into what it is now. So hmm. you, you definitely have that old soul aspect to you. Like, I don't think it came to you from, uh, you know, watching turkey hunting on TV. You, you got it from, like you said, trying to mimic those noises at the bird feeder and just enjoying being outside and, and wandering and roaming and oh yeah, good old country boy way. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of influences as far as turkey hunting goes. There was nobody that did it. And, uh, it was kind of, I paved my own way just watching what little bit I read a lot of magazines, magazines, you know, used yeah. to be a big, big deal. And that's where you got a lot of information. So I read and, and studied and then just like, you know, like most folks and just school of hard knocks, getting out there and getting it wrong, you know, and, and mm-hmm. trying to learn. I'm still, I'm still getting it wrong a lot. I, so, I hadn't quite figured it out. So being spending the morning or so with him is so incredible. And just, you could, I mean, he just gives off all those, all the experience of all that time. But the coolest thing beyond all the turkey, whatever you want to call it, expertise and everything and, and all, it's just, he's so good at that because he's so tuned into them. Everything mm-hmm. about them, every little thing, you know, and it, like you, you hear him when he's, failed at something a long time that teaches him a lesson for the future how to correct that and all but he's so tuned into nature in general and that's the point i like to make to everybody if you, that's probably what makes him so good at the turkey and deer and everything but he's so tuned into all the little things going on he's got an awareness that's so much broader than just about anybody i've been out there when it could be something coming up that's blooming or something birds singing or but just there's a being in you know instead of just going and being kind of in a linear focus of like kill the turkey you know, he's so tuned into the whole experience. And, I, man, I, I pray for everybody they could get a little dose of that out there from Dave. I had to say that, Dave, because it was so cool. I appreciate that. And yeah, I, I, pre- I think because I'm, I'm one of those, once I get out there, I feel like everything's in concert, right? Everything uh-huh. yes. happens for a reason. Nothing like we as people, we may wander around, the you know, City Hall or may go downtown or whatever. And we kind of just wander around doing nothing for no, doing something for no reason. And I don't think anything in the wild does that. I don't think anything just wanders in the wild. I think everything has a purpose and, and everything happens for a reason. So um, I think the more you're in tune to it, and I love the uh, 
the idea or what I always attempt to do is try to get out there without disrupting it, yes. you know, trying to, yes. you know, trying to get out there, Absolutely. enjoy it, not disrupt it. Cause I feel like you, if you're, I want to be successful out there. If you want to put your hands on a turkey or whatever you define success is to me, I just want to be amongst them. I just want to be out there without them knowing I'm out there and be one of the crowd, so to speak. So in order to do that, you need to get out there without, you know, ruffling all the feathers and letting everything know you're there. So yes. um, trying to just kind of creep in there and, and go unnoticed. Well, that'll is, also uh, improve your success when you go back and, yeah, uh, for sure. and also for your fellow hunters, you're, you're helping, you're helping everybody by doing that. Yeah, I always said just pretend when you go in the gate, like you can go and enjoy it and do it and nothing ever saw you, nothing ever heard you, nothing ever smelled you. I know that's impossible, but if you kind of go with that intention he's talking about, it will help everything, especially oh, yeah. if you have your own place, even your own club. And honestly, it's more important if you got multiple people hunting the same place that everybody mm -hmm. behaves that way because mm -hmm. it'll help everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um. Dave, I wanted to ask you more about some of the vocalizations and things you make. Um, do you ever add like, you know, Jake Yelps and Clucks, or do you ever do any male uh, turkey vocalizations? you have that in your arsenal? Oh, for sure. I think that's one of the things that when I started, not that I was the first one to do it, a million people have done it, but I do it quite a bit. I do the kind of provoke that jealousy factor into a lot of my uh, little pet, pictures I paint, I always say paint a picture because when I, as soon as I start engaging with a turkey, I start trying to think in his mind, like, what did he just hear? And what did he just draw from that? Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of times if I'm, uh, yelping to him and, and just getting a reaction, um, but maybe he's not stepping as quick as I want him to, or maybe I'm just wanting to kind of, uh, further elaborate on the paint, uh, on the picture that I'm painting. A lot of times I'll Jake yelp at his gobble or one of my favorite things to do is once that turkey gets within, you know, a distance where I can hear him drumming, um, I don't know how many times you've, you've probably heard a, a, a turkey will drum and a Jake will caulk right back at him, just mm -hmm. right over the top of it. It's almost like a, it's like a reaction, like a knee, like when you get tapped in your knee and you're in your, you know, it's like your reflexes. It's a quiver um, sound, he, you know. Exactly. And those Jakes cannot help it. You'll get one particular Jake that just, I think all day, every day for the whole spring, when that turkey drums, he caulks at it, whether it's at midnight or lunch, like he does it. And so, you can keep up with a flock of turkeys by if you if you get close enough to that Jake to hear him. It, the turkey ain't got a gobble, you know his his buddy or his, um, you know the the strutting turkey of the flock ain't got a gobble. It's as long as that Jake, you're close enough to keep up with that Jake talking, and you can hear those, you know, usually a couple hundred yards or even more. Uh, so I use that. I try to paint that same picture. Um, if I can hear that that turkey drum, and I'll call right back at him, and uh, it just further kind of illustrates what you're what you're trying to say is there's turkeys over there and. And there's a hen over there that you've already mimicked that he knows in the area. And uh, and she's got Jake's around and, and that jealousy factor, I think, peaks and 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 they'll wind up in him at your feet. That the drumming sound just do you, fascinates. Do you drum me. at him? Do you ever make a drumming sound to him? I've tried it a time or two. Um yep. I can't say it's something that I've done with with something that with success that I could just put I know my one finger time, on so that honestly, was what it did. One time I could probably attribute it to one coming on in once mm. and I, you know i've dealt a deep voice it's not that hard to do pretty close well give us a little look no look. Yeah. <laughs> i want to hear it yeah, and, hear and so I, i'm just saying i've like him uh i don't can't say that i've you know lanny says she can't hear i've it. never heard it i've, I've heard mm. it one well, time it, yeah. and it was the turkey i don't know how many years low ago. frequency high frequency you know so the thing, turkey was people. literally what two feet from me yeah and I heard his 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 feathers <laughs> ruffle more than anything, but I did hear it. So that is the only turkey I've ever heard drum of all the ones I've been fortunate enough but, to mess with. Well, <laughs> hey, real quick, before we get off the Jake Calico thing, he pointed that out. And honestly, I I never really discovered that or figured out. I'm on David and Harold taught me that. The drum, they, yeah, they were boy, they were you know about pioneers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and they just their thing was, and I just want to say that for everybody to add to what he said. If you're out there and nothing's going on, and you're just like maybe you're an afternoon in the woods, and you're just calling and being patient, and you know like a lot of people, if you hear that, ninety percent of the time there's a strutting long beard with them, and mm -hmm. that's why they do it. It's just a note or maybe two, and it's real quivery. Because he's having, I guess, a, some kind of almost a sexual response to the, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to react to another turkey strutting. I don't know what it is, but it's a real quivery sound. But if you hear that, 
don't write it off. Oh, Jake. It's like, that's probably money right there. Mm. Just be patient with that's it. That's a good tip. Yep. So, Dave, can you course drumming? Ooh, sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> I think it has a lot to do with what's around you. If it's, uh, it's tough. um, yeah, it could be really tough. It could be especially can, in well, steep terrain. Yeah, once you've heard it for sure, too, every truck starting up in the distance, you can oh, start man. imagining yeah. drumming sounds yeah, yeah, so yeah. much more yeah. if you've heard it once mm-hmm. that day. Yeah. Uh, but, but it is unmistakable. Once you hear it and you're hearing it, it and typically I can't hear it very far. So oh, I can. We, uh, for whatever reason. I, I can, can hear it several hundred, I, I couple hundred yards. Some of them are louder around. than others. Yeah, let me ask you that, too. I've This is what's happened to me. I just feel like, you know, every now and then you can hear a turkey and then you realize you're hearing a turkey drumming like 250 yards. Mm-hmm. And every time I've ever had that happen and killed them, it was an old turkey. And say, I think, do you think the older birds have a louder drum than the two year olds? Whew, I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't have For me, clue. every time it's happened. <laughs> but, and, you know, so uh, Jake's will drum and make a drumming sound, but I, it's kind of a, Shorter note, but I remember distinctly this turkey. It was towards the end of the season, and they'll do this old turkey. It had a Jake gobble, and I was like, oh, nothing left but just a Jake. Mm-hmm. It was a short gobble. And then so I was thinking, you know, if nothing else is in here, I'll probably go try something else. And then all of a sudden I could hear him drumming, and I could hear him drumming loud, and it's a wide open, like, flat of uh, uh, willow oaks right there. You could see at least 200 yards, and I knew where it was coming from, and I was like, that turkey's so far away. It's got to be a big long bread. It can't be like a Jake or something. And sure enough, it ended up later on, here he came, and it was an old, old turkey. I don't know. A lot of times I've heard them. Every now and then it's like, I can't believe I heard that turkey drumming so far away. So they do drum louder than others. So I don't know. may not be, but yeah. I've always found it to be an old, old turkey when they could do that. Yeah, sometimes you you almost have to be looking at them, and they're 40 yards away, and they're, yeah. they pop into strut, and yep. you can barely hear it. And Sometimes, like you said, that thing may be 300 yards away, and it sounds like he's 10 yards away. Gosh, I just ain't never heard one that far away. Oh, I can I hear him have. spit. I, I've I seen them and you know watched them. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. Nosler is known for their bullets, and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate, and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. I was was thinking, I was wondering if that was per turkey, and I was wondering if each turkey has the ability, like we can scream and then we can talk soft sometimes. I'm wondering, because I I had a video last year, where was that? I was in Wisconsin, and there's a pair of gobblers out there in the field, and they were, I had to hit them with a range finder, and I think it was like 157 yards or something like that. And then turkeys were gobbling at my yelping, and you could not hear it. You could just see their necks come out. And it wasn't windy. You could hear the songbirds, and I was on camera, and I remember Mm -hmm. saying, listen, you can hear the songbirds around me. The audio on the camera is just fine. Like everything is normal, but watch these turkeys. And I'm, I flip the camera around and I yelp with the turkey and you see their necks come out, but you don't hear it. I mean, you just barely hear it. Hmm. And I think, you know, I think those turkeys that just had the ability to just gobble, they just weren't putting a lot of enthusiasm behind it. So the volume was just low. And I wonder about the same thing with drumming. It I think could sometimes. Be. Yeah. They're broadcasting yeah. it. So it's a lot louder or mm-hmm. they're, drum into something close by trying to attract that and it's not as loud that could easily be it but i always try to listen early in the morning when i i I like to get there early but there is you know there seems to be once or twice a season i'll i'll be sitting there in the dark and i'll hear one drumming and then and then that really drives me crazy because i can't course Mm. it but Mm. that's one of the great mysteries that i think that's one of the most exhilarating things i mean other than having one surprise you at close range with a good gobble uh, that that drumming and a loud drumming, so you know, and it's drumming getting closer, but you can't locate it. I mean, to mm. me, that's one of the most exciting, unnerving things about turkeys. You know, footfalls do the same thing for me. Like when you get footfalls and dry leaves, and you right. know he's going to come, and you know he's fixing to crest this ridge, you, ledge, and you know it's important for you to have that that gun barrel in the right spot. I mean, a foot one way or the other could be 
catastrophe, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you're trying to like not just course the 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 leaf, the footfalls and the leaves, but like be exact. That thing that 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 sends my I get my nerves. I just about have to just explode. <laughs> Um, Golly. Good stuff. Oh, you know, we, I'm pumped. We've, yeah. <laughs> we're getting some questions from listeners that we probably need to get on uh, soon. But I, I had one more question for you, um, and this happens to me a lot, unfortunately. But uh, just say you're walking through the woods, and you look up, and you kind of get busted. You see a hen, and she's acting a little nervous and kind of slowly walking away. I mean, do you just give up right there, or, or do you? Uh, do you sit down and hope they come back? Do you do you give them some vocalizations to try to calm them down? Can you just go over uh, that scenario and, and how you usually handle it? Only way I'm going to call to a turkey that's seen me is if I think there's other turkeys that haven't seen me. Like if, if the flock, rest of the flock's over the ridge or something, I'm going to try to calm them down because I've had that work in the past. I mean, I've completely walked around the corner, blew the hen to smithereens, you know, and she's flying to the next county and he gobbles at her wing beats or something and have to hit the ground and, and put on the show that, you know, kind of pick up where she left off. Um, I guess it's uh, per situation there mm-hmm. for that. Um, I don't ever think I'm completely out of the game unless I watch him. I mean, even if I watch him fly to the next County, if I can go hunt in the next County, I'll get around in front of him and let him settle yeah. down and, and reset the stage. Um, so I don't ever feel like I'm completely out of the game. But, uh, but boy, I do not like bumping a turkey. I don't no. care if it's a hen or a jake no, or right. I don't, I, I eat. I mean, if we mm. kill a turkey and there's more with it, we usually, we may lay there for an hour letting the other turkey kind of just drift off. I can't stand for a turkey to see me. Lanny. What? <sighs> you need, we need to rewind that at some point <laughs> and you pay attention to it. I just like to get my hands on them. I hope I'll lay down hope, after that. I yeah. hope you were taking notes the whole time uh, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lanny, I like Lanny learned to yep in an ammunition factory. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as soon as before that shell is out of the gun, oh, laying on the ground, he's on his feet racing. I'm scared to the they're going to get away. And I mean, the, we didn't always have TSS, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, well, but going back, I like what he said about he's optimistic all the time. You know, it, that's it, one of those I things I got that from Cuz. The first one that ever said it was Cuz. And he was talking about, and because he, I mean, let's face it, look at the people he's hunted with too. Yeah. And he said the really great ones. He said, in my opinion, the number one thing, the really great ones, keep on believing there's one behind every tree. And that's exactly what you're talking about. They, they stay optimistic. They don't throw their hat down and get mad and, it, you know, I didn't hear anything or he's leaving me or, you know, he, he just keeps his optimism. And I was just glad to hear him say that because that reinforces what Cuz always said too. I mm-hmm. think there's so much to that. Oh, yeah. Man. Confidence kills. You win the game. That's right. If you walk in and there's a turkey that's just gobbling his head off in the tree, do you handle him a little bit different? More so than how he's gobbling. Now, granted, there's extremes to ever measure, I guess, but uh, I'm more interested in how he responds to the call. Um, if he's gobbling like crazy and then he shuts up, I'm like, oh, man, this one's this one's weird. Um, and and those those turkeys can be, can be a bear to deal with, but um, – more, more to you know, more than how he's gobbling on his own, which I, everybody loves a free goblin turkey, right? So one that you can get in just the right position before he ever knows you're there. Um, Toxie talked about that just a second ago. Like if he's gobbling and you can get in the perfect place before he ever knows you're there, before you ever had to put the call to him, that's the best case scenario. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in how he responds to the call. I would rather have a turkey that's just gobbling sporadically but he gobbles every time I call to him as he's kind of tells me that he's listening intently, which is the, the, all we can ask for as a turkey hunter is to have a turkey that listens to us. And so that's, what's more important to me than him just gobbling a lot is him gobbling when I want him to gobble and when I need him to gobble to let me know that, that he's listening to what I'm saying. So that way I can, I can tell him whatever lie that I want him to hear, you know, right. There's a, there's a, I think there's a tipping point decision you got to make though, too. And it's like, he, he pointed it out earlier. It's like, so to kill a really old turkey who's got a bunch of hens, it's tough. And one of the best ways to do it is if you can get him on the ground before they're on the ground, you know? And so that mm-hmm. means more to it. Right. At the same mm-hmm. time, you know, I've had that, try to have that happen and it just backfires by having caused <laughs> too much. And mm-hmm. then he's just almost in voids where you are. So there's a tipping point where you got to decide – I'm going to try to get him on the ground. What Dave does to, to me when I watched him do that, actually, he does a lot. When he does a lot of calling, it's not, like, loud. You know, his 
90% of what comes out of his mouth or the mouth call, which is incredible, it's very soft. And But he changes all the time, up and down. And when he hits them hard, it's like from a soft yep, bam, a short thing, back to soft. It isn't like yep, 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 all the same thing all the time. And uh, it's just amazing to watch that work. But he does, when one's on the limb, he's not doing a lot of loud calling to him. So can you get them too hot in the tree? Mm. I don't know about that. Yeah, on public ground for sure. You can draw more attention to him than he needs to than you need mm-hmm. to have on him. Yeah, that's um but I think I think there's like you were talking about that tipping point. There becomes a time when you're gonna keep him on the tree too long. You know, I think all the old timers like don't call to him in the tree, they'll stay up there forever. Um, I definitely don't believe that. I like yelping to a turkey in a tree, I like making sure he's pointed my way when he starts to set them wings. But um I think I think provoking his interest and getting him interested and keeping him his curiosity up. Is this all I'm trying to do in the tree? I just want to, I just want to keep his curiosity up. If the turkey's by itself and I, 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 you know, I capture that curiosity, then I'll just kind of seal my lips from there. The only time I'm going to keep on keeping on on him is typically if there's if there's other females in the picture. So if there's if it's a competition, um, that's when you kind of got to keep chatting with him, in my opinion. Yeah, and you liable to, you know, there's competition with those hens. You liable to make a hen mad and mm-hmm. call her up. That might be your best chance of all, you know. Mm-hmm. So. A lot of that early season stuff we talked to, we, we mentioned earlier, it can be, um, I'm, oh, I'm calling to the boss hen, and, and and while I like to hear him gobble, I'm wanting to see, kind of trying to gauge her, um, how she's going to react, because you're trying to either, you don't want to push her away. If she's one of those non-confrontational hens, and you can kind of hear that inner voice where she's not wanting to crawl on top of you, she may respond to you, but she's not being aggressive, then you have to kind of te- you know, kind of have to, uh, treat her with like a, you know, a little tender hand. But if you can find one of those hens that wants to be aggressive, wants to kind of cut at you and then crawl back on you, then you can get into that exchange. And yeah, yeah, that can definitely work in your favor. If you can get her uh, hot under the collar and get her, you know, making some ground, then then usually everybody follows and that's when it gets real fun. Hey, I've got a good question. I want to jump in here in case we get too long and I don't ask it because I want him to talk about, and I'm, you know, whatever, I don't want to say the beginner or whoever, because I mean, sometimes take people take to it really quick or whatever, but there's so many calls to choose from. And I, I got, I did a deal for Onyx the other day. And that's one of the questions was about, you know, someone, a first time caller and what call would you use or whatever. But the, the big thing to me is like the mouth call and people being so anxious to feel like they're more advanced by using a mouth call. And sometimes it's too soon. Mm-hmm. I just want Dave to talk about how he would handle a first time or are very, you know, new to the game and the calls they would – how to choose that and also how to handle, you know, getting good on a mouth call and what you would strive for. So, I, I'm i not – I'm just asking you. I would love to hear what you say about that topic because it's a big one. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the mouth call is the most versatile. Uh, it's hands-free. So, there's so many advantages to, to, uh, to having uh, the ability to use a mouth call. So, I think it is important, even if you're not proficient at it, to be able to do enough – to, for those closing few, you know, those closing few yards, or to keep his attention when you can't use your hands or whatnot, um, is it necessary to to be able to be, uh, you know, some uh, grand national caller to, to kill a turkey with a mouth call? <clears throat> I think we all know the answer to that. Um, and as far as you know, a, a beginner, um, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Some people can run a box, and some people uh, like you know a pot style call, uh, but some people just can't seem to get. I've had people I've tried to get to run a pot call forever and ever and ever. They just can't get that whole striker angle and stuff down. It just blows their mind. And um, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with it, when your hand's shaking a little bit, when you're trying to work a turkey, it's just really not going to work out for you. So, yeah, more so um, push peg calls are good for those folks. And something that has kind of kind of uh, gotten some, uh, you know, I guess we'll say wind beneath its wings is the uh, is the the suction type collars, the wing bones and the and the trumpets and stuff that people have kind of had a reemergence and not that they were ever not popular, but it's just a lot of folks are starting to use them now. And some people can pick those up and just it's just natural for them. So I think it's really important for everybody to experiment to see what what is it easiest for you to get something that somewhat sounds like a turkey on and work at that one the most. Um, why not kind of uh, kind of cater to your strengths, I guess. See what it is that kind of just falls into your wheelhouse without a lot of effort and kind of perfect that enough to use that as your mainstay when it comes to fooling a turkey. And then I do think it is pretty doggone important to uh, 
to be able to do something on a mouth call enough, like a low volume yelp or clucking yes. or something, mm-hmm. so Absolutely. that you can have that hands free aspect to close the turkey a lot of times. So yeah, I just to add one thing to add is like I would be so the last point he made it to me the most important one is that look for a mouth call that is so easy doesn't take much air at all for you and work on a, the best you can turkey sound a soft sound don't spend all your time with a call that you blow really loud and can cut on and make you know maybe feeling a little more advanced in it because the, the most useful thing in the world for a mouth call and for me too is what i call a finishing yelper and that's when you do not need to be moving your hands around a pot call or a mouth call or anything. And also, when something's close, the 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 less the sound, the less loud it is. They can't quite pinpoint you as, as good either. Or it may give them the impression. I mean, a lot of times I'm using friction calls loudly, and then you know to make it sound like you're further back, you know, something soft. So my point in saying all that is what he said. Just be sure that sticks in people's mind. Look for one first. That sounds great, very soft. And I don't think people do that enough is my own reason for saying that. I think it's really, I think it's a, it's much more difficult to sound like a turkey when you got the volume really low. Um, yes. Everybody yes. seems to be able to throw a mouth call in and, and get a, a loud yelp. But if you ever try to take that yelp and get that low volume, yes, that's when it, everything falls to pieces. Well, it's typically so, uh, less reeds, not as thick of latex, mm-hmm. like less back tension, you know, it may be just a two read type of call, but I would, when you're buying some mouth calls, look for something. You can make a turkey sound, very light turkey sound. And boy, that I, that may help you kill more turkeys than anything you do call wise to have that in your arsenal. Mm-hmm. Good advice. Kind of adding to that, everybody seems to get stuck when you start talking about low volume calling, low volume turkey calling and finishing touches on turkeys. They always get stuck on that cluck and purr. And purr is something that's extremely difficult to do on a mouth call. And it is absolutely, in my opinion, it is absolutely not necessary. Um, you can low volume yelp to those turkeys and just wit and whistle and stuff that it will get the job done and, and carries the same significance because clucking and purring, purring and specifically, can be very difficult for some people on a mouth yelper. Um, and they feel like that's what they're supposed to do. Granted, it's it's awesome to do. It's awesome to have the ability to, to cluck and purr to that turkey and paint that picture. But if you listen to a lot of turkeys, you know, scratching and 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 bugging or whatnot, they don't they don't have to purr. They can be low volume yelping and, and single note yelping and and clucking and stuff. So don't get hung up on. Right. Um, I need to be able to cluck and purr on a turkey call to finish the gobbler at close range. That's 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 not the case. I mean, as long as you can do that little muffled yelping and that little uh, muted yelping and stuff that, that serves the same purpose in my opinion. I've never been able to purr on a mouth call. Mm. What about Yelp? Uh, by my, <laughs> by my, <laughs> by my standards. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, Throw it out there. Well, well, <laughs> Dave, I got, I got a pretty serious uh, question that I'm sure a lot of people would like to know. It's, it's a two part question. Are you more of a backwoods uh, cigar guy or Swisher sweets? Mm. Oh man, it's always the Swishers because they're always available at the dog on gas station. Everybody's <laughs> like, "Man, you're a big cigar guy." So, buddy, I wouldn't know my tail from a hole in the ground as far as in a cigar shop. I just we get whatever enough. If I did smoke a real cigar, you'd probably have to airlift me out of there. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with it. So yeah, we just do the do the cheap stuff, something to slow us down. You have a little ritual that's pretty cool, and I know it's not for show. You didn't bring it up. You don't like talking about it, other than. It's just something you do, I think, that's pretty cool. And it goes back to that being tuned in, too. T- talk about that when you kill a turkey somewhere. What, do you have any kind of little ritual you do? We just, uh, and this is something that my buddy Chubbs, if y'all have watched that, the folks have watched the Pinotti Project, the early seasons, for sure. We hunted a lot together when he was my neighbor. But uh, something that he did and the old fellas that kind of showed him the ropes did, and it was just a way to slow down. Um, and I got really bad, uh, especially during the whole chasing the – the uh the 49 state slam the u.s super slam or whatever they call it uh to kind of get in a hurry and there was no reason to and so that was uh we started you know kind of slowing down and the, our way of doing that was smoking a cigar uh, over our gobbler and and uh not getting into a hurry and picking him up and and heading back to the truck so quick and um soaking in that moment that uh and, and reliving the hunt and talking about the the reasons things happened or the reasons things didn't happen. And it just kind of gotten to where it was just, uh, obviously it's ballooned into much more now, but it just got to 
simply as a way of slowing down. Um, turkeys gobbling in the distance, it can be really tempting to just hang that turkey up and go chase another one. And not that we still have it from time to time, but it, there is at least um, a certain amount of time there where we're going to light a cigar and we're going to kick back and we're going to just kind of uh, revel in the moment, I guess you can say. And that's kind of our way of doing that. And that's one of the things that we have in the vest that makes us slow down. Like you're going to have to stop and, and smoke this cigar and, and talk about it to, uh, to not get yourself in a hurry. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty neat. cool. He didn't, we didn't, you know, the sun was shining, it was beautiful. And he was like, to stop right here. And I mean, it was like, you know, probably five minutes of just touching the turkey, looking at every feather. He was impressed. He's like, the eyelashes on this one are actually more pronounced than I'm used to. It's so beautiful, which of those little black eyelashes mm -hmm. on the feathers, which is so cool. I hadn't heard it call that. But, you know, every little thing about it just really – you know, a kind of immersing yourself in the gratitude for killing one. It's such a great moment. And I mean, it's so, I'm getting chill. It's such a rush when it happens when you're a turkey hunter. Oh, yeah. It, so, yeah. I mean, for him, it's like stop and really enjoy that for a minute, you know, in, in the peace of the woods and everything. Being a music lover, it, it kind of reminds me of the, the encore, you know, where the band, mm -hmm. they finish their show and then they walk off stage and everybody sits there for a minute. Are they going to come back and then? Then you come back and, and soak the moment in for yeah. an, another few more minutes and mm -hmm. and say your thanks, you know, for yeah. being able to experience it. That, that moment's going to fade before long. That's but right. while it's happening, man, just enjoy it and Rebel. soak it up. Yeah, that's You don't ever know how many you're going to have. And, that's right. and coming full circle, um, stuff that I didn't even realize, stuff that hadn't even hit me uh, in the in the current climate of turkeys uh, speaking and, and hearing um just the gauntlet of, of life for a wild turkey and what it takes for a turkey to reach adulthood, and especially a gobbler to reach adulthood. And, and if you're the one that, that claimed his life and he's, he died at your hands, um, the least you can do is slow down and appreciate what all he had to go through Absolutely. just to get himself there. Amen. You know what I mean? So that's kind of, um, and I mean, you can talk, you can talk to, uh, you know, Dr. Chamberlain and, and Collier and those guys, and you start hearing them talk about the percentages like just the and when they start breaking it down into the numbers, it can be a little easier to understand, I guess, for some of us. But the percentage of turkeys that you know or make it to the ground as an egg, and then that right, you know, make it all the way to adulthood, and then we're lucky enough to um, to take them. That's kind of just that in itself should give us enough reason to slow down and appreciate what they've given us there. So mm -hmm. that's a reason for pause right there. Oh my gosh! Sure. Yeah, and you know when you've had years or spans in your life when they weren't there yeah you know we've had some tougher times man it makes you appreciate it so much more mm -hmm. when you get things back kind of where they need to be uh, dave to toxic's point uh, have have you've probably hunted areas and you've seen turkeys uh, seen more turkeys than you're probably seeing today but just overall the landscape in the southeast are you are you seeing more turkeys than you historically did are you seeing fewer or what's your thought there i bet you I, I have a pretty unique um obviously what i do now and traveling and seeing different parts of the country and not staying in one place more than a handful of days um everything for me uh like you just mentioned uh talks you just mentioned like seeing periods where there weren't many turkeys, I've been fortunate enough to not see that. Like I've always had turkeys. There's always been turkeys around. Sure. There's some areas that have fewer turkeys than they used to, but there's some areas that have more turkeys than they used to. So it's always like a, a give and take, um, as far as regions go. But, um, but as far as like say 10 years ago to now, um, I feel like I'm sitting down on just as many turkeys as I, as I ever have. Um, but it does take, uh, and what I think people, turkey hunters, uh, people in general in every aspect of life, I guess, is adapting, um, being able to, there came a certain amount of time where people were like, I went to this national forest road and I heard 12 turkeys. I go to this national forest road. Now I only hear two turkeys and I'm like, and they, they think it's a turkey problem and not saying it's not sometimes, you know, it may be, but that timber changes, everything changes. Mm -hmm. And um, if they would take that National Forest Road and, and go two roads over, they could hear those 12 turkeys. But um, I see a lot more of that than I do um, anything else is, is people's inability to adapt and kind of tailor themselves to, to uh, putting themselves in a position to hear that same amount of turkeys. Um, but as far as uh, 
so I guess to answer your question in, in shorter form is yes, so there is some areas that I see fewer turkeys, but there's just as many areas that I see more turkeys as well. So yeah, that's, that's, that's encouraging. Good. That's, that's yeah. encouraging. Yeah. So I, I've got one more question. Uh, do you have like a in your mind's eye when you're walking in in the morning and it's 45 minutes before daylight's going to break? Are you thinking? Is there a time when you're saying he's awake now? He, I, I know he he's he should be awake. Uh, phew, I don't know. It's just usually about the time the whipper wheels quit and the, and the red birds start and for me. Um, that's about when I'm thinking, I know that he's drumming on the limb now. He may not have gobbled yet, but he's awake. Um, I've crawled up under too many of them and tried to get set up before it broke daylight to start hearing them drumming and before he gobbles. And I'm thinking, all right, you gotta be careful. Don't pop that stick. Cause he's already awake, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of, and it's, and it's funny because it's morning to morning. I'm sure all of us can say, you know, those heavy overcast days, those days where the, um, the, the, you know, the, um, the clouds are real heavy. It's going to rain, you know, about an hour after daylight, you know, so everything seems to be sluggish to wake up. Um, so those type days, I, I try to, you know, try to determine when I think he's awake by what everything else around him is doing. You know, all the songbirds and stuff. I really pay attention to the songbirds and crows. Um, on those days when you turkeys don't seem to be gobbling, you also don't seem to be hearing as many crows. It's just like everything's a little bit lethargic on yeah. some days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lanny. Uh, just speaking of that, in, in the morning ritual, uh, when you're on the road and, and hunting a lot, how much, I mean, I guess, are you roosting birds in the evening for the next morning? We try to. We try to. In some areas of the country, that's really effective. And like if you're out west and you're hunting Miriams, it's almost a must. Mm -hmm. You know, those, those, it's really a, a big advantage if you can be close to them off the limb because they move so doggone fast. If you ain't got a leg up on them when it breaks daylight, if you can't get up to them before their legs start moving, you can really be behind the, behind the ball there. So we do do a lot of roosting. Um, and shoot, man, I'm, I'm usually going to try now, right. whether it's effective or not when it comes to Easterns and Osceolas, but I'm going to give it a whirl if, if at all possible. Cause I love having an idea on where to start. And so are you sure howling at them in, in the Southeast with a coyote call or. Um, yeah, sometimes usually it's just owling uh, mm -hmm. or fly up cackle. I do, I do quite a bit of fly up cackling. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll get a tube call or whatnot. I'll start with a mouth yelper and not blow them off the limb if I'm close. And then if not, I'll get in. I love getting up a big valley or something and being able to get that tube call and just pick, 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 and letting that echo up through there and then just kind of training yourself to just listen, you know, almost close your eyes. Let, you know, let's only, let's only depend on our ears to give us the direction and listen to him gobble and say, okay, I need to start on this mountainside because I do hunt a lot of big, steep stuff. So yeah. if you're on the wrong mountain, that can be an hour and a half to get over there to him. So it really helps if you're on the right mountain to get started. And if he tells me that, the evening before, that's a that's a big leg up. Right. Yeah, that sure is. Dudley, you want to ask one of the uh, a couple of the questions that yeah, popped in? Yeah. Uh, so a listener named Zach, I couldn't pronounce his last name, so we're going to stick with Zach. Um, he's uh, he's from Kentucky, and I, I know you hunt a lot of different areas. Um, but it, you know, when you are in an area that's got a lot of rolling hills or you know mountains and things, do you typically try to get above them or below them or is there any rhyme or reason to that when you're setting if you up give me my yeah if you give me my rathers i'm going to be above them for sure um it's just uh just what seems to work i guess it just always gives you the ability to kind of move on the turkey a little easier um but i don't like people get stuck in that mindset they have to be above them a lot of times mm -hmm. and there are certain parts of the country um one of my places that i that i hunted a lot and grew up hunting um, I got into the habit of it was just easier to get close to the turkey from below um, because it was a lot of that uh, that uh, state ground that the tops had been cut. And so they were small pines and pines had gotten a little age to them. So it was clean up under them. The um, the uh, creek drains and stuff still had some timber in them and, and, and you know, it was steep enough to where you could use those creek drains and get into where the water had washed the leaves away. So you could, you know, make good ground quietly by walking to where the water had washed the leaves away. So I made a habit of approaching a lot of turkeys from, from below. Um, but yeah, give me my rathers. I'd, I'd love to, I always start on top. I like to be able to get up on top and hear a lot and move from the turkey and drop down on the turkey. That's perfect perfect case scenario for me 
That makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, definitely come from above. But if, if you can make a quieter approach from below, that, that may be the better option in that scenario. Um, and, and then I've got another one from Brandon Corley. Uh, he was just wanting to know, do you, you know, when you get to a new area, I mean, do you immediately take off uh, with your shotgun over your shoulder or do you ever spend time, you know, scouting before you actually go in there with your shotgun? Uh, we do armed scouting a lot to where we're, we're kind of kicking around and dragging our feet and kind of sniffing the area out. But we usually have a shotgun over our shoulder if it's, you know, unless it's unless season's not in yet. Right. Um, that makes total and, sense. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of armed scouting. <laughs> that's uh, that's actually the words he used was armed scouting. So that must be mm -hmm. some lingo. Well, I, I, mean, I hadn't heard. Yeah, you not to mention self-protection, especially if you're hunting some, you know, big open public ground, I'd be a little insecure not to have my weapon with me anyway. <laughs> black panther. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might run I'm into a black bit. panther. Yeah, yeah. Never can tell. Snakes. I'm a wet hot sportsman after wild game. Uh, <laughs> uh, so rich. Bobby must have Bobby <laughs> must have come up with that. Yeah, no, I think that sounded Bobby as shit. Uh, Richie. <laughs> so you got one more. We had a we had a bunch. Pick out the best last, um, last best one. So uh, Will wanted to know, and, and I'm sp I think he's specifically talking about, you know, hunting. Uh, do you prefer a, a fresh burn or do you a pr prefer a one-year-old burn, that kind of thing? Mm. Uh, is there like a terrain feature? He's specifically talking about areas that, you know, that get burned. But uh, if, if you're trying to find that perfect strut zone or something like that, is that – uh, usually going to be in fresh burn or areas that had been burned in the past and regenerated a little bit. Uh, to me, that's, that's, that's region specific um, because if it's hardwood timber or something that has a lot of hardwood timber around it, um, I like for it to be fresh, like real fresh. I don't think you can get too fresh. Mm -hmm. um, but now if you're down in the swamps, um, like situations like Florida, those guys, they, they do those Gila balls where they'll drop and fire. So you may wind up in the middle of a, 20,000 acre fire um, because of the, the, the fashion that they have to burn. So um, for those, I like for them to be a few weeks old because I like to know that, that everything has time to kind of uh, reset itself because when you have a fire of that magnitude, it really disrupts a lot. Um, these low grade, smaller fires that you can, you can find um, uh, in a lot of the uh, state ground or national forest or stuff around here. I like them. I like them fresh. Um, but uh, I guess hopefully that answered that question. Yeah. I think so. And, and I'll add um, that I kind of like the edge of a burn. You know, they, they seem to, turkeys seem to be creatures of the edge anyway. So if you can find the edge of where the, you know, the burn stops uh, and it's connected to some good cover, uh, that's often a, a, good, a good place to set up. Um, and then our, my buddy Taylor Sweeten asked, uh, what's your most memorable turkey hunting story? We may want to save that for later, but uh, I'd love to hear your most memorable turkey story. Yeah. Oh, man, I don't even know. It's so impossible. I appreciate every single dog on one of them. But probably the next one is probably the most memorable one. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, <laughs> hey, that's what the best uh, <laughs> pro athletes in the world say, what's the most important game, and they'll tell you. The coaches say, the next one. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Good answer. Great right answer. That's a great yeah. answer. So, Dave, we always uh, when we ha we have a guest, we always we have a trivia question that we always ask, and uh, and the, uh, and someone who has left us a review has a chance to win a prize. So, we picked out a trivia question specifically for you. Today's trivia is brought to you by Sheffield Financial. Fuel your gamekeeper projects with financing for power sports, outdoor power equipment, and trailers. Begin your next conservation adventure at sheffieldfinancial.com. Look, guys, I just handed it to Mac because we learned last week that Mac is texting answers to people. Oh, yeah. We can't trust so Mac, Mac anymore. Mac, Where's my phone? Where's so, my phone? <laughs> so please, you know. All right, so Bobby forgets that he handed me the question, so we're going to flip the table, and I've got a question for Bobby before we get into your oh, question. Oh, I yeah. love this. Okay. This is right. good. Wow. Ra yeah, rating, of turn. Ratings just went up. Yeah. yeah. All right, Bobby, what does the name Penhody mean? There you go. It, it's turkey home. It's hit, a, it, hit your it's, old mail. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a Creek Indian word. That's, That's exactly right. Hit All your right. home word. Yeah. Now we got that out of the way. All right, Dave, so you're playing for Archie Fan, who left us a good review. What, what is that? What, what is Archie Fan? 
they're obviously an Ole Miss. I guess a Texas fan. Oh, a maybe, Texas yeah, fan. maybe it's an Ole Miss. Could yeah. be a Texas fan, too. Okay, yeah, yeah, too. That's right. right. Archie. You know, Arch, there's other schools other than Auburn. Manning. You know. Archie oh, Comics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's the Archie Comics. Uh, yeah. no, but he's number one Archie fan. So well, guys, look, fan. look, you got a trivia question. You're asking a guy with a turkey IQ of 200, so you better – Dial it in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's dialed in. All right. Oh, so here we go. It should be in your sweet spot, Dave. All right. What is another common name for the pelated woodpecker? There's a Ooh, bunch of them. Yeah, let's see. Um, common name. Why, why are you thinking? Pelated woodpecker? No. He, well, ask the question again, Mac. Um, and you said pelated. I think most people pronounce it pileated. pileated. Yep. Well, ask the question again. You can ask it, Dudley. No, you, you ask it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nardo. Uh, there you go. He, he What's did, just another yeah. name for the for a woodpecker? What, the pileated woodpecker. Yeah. Pileated woodpecker. Is this the Ooh. same pileated? Is that a state bird in any particular state that you know of? You know, the huge woodpecker that sounds like mm-hmm. a monkey? Oh, yeah. We used to do them for a locator call. I had we yeah, still works oh, yeah. really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As far as man, that's what. Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of names name other than other than a woodpecker, just a pileated woodpecker. What do you mean a, a common name? What, the, like what, a, a, what a do other people name. call them? A slang name you might have heard. Some country person on the side of the road said, "Yeah, that you know, I heard a blank blank like a shell cracker." Or, you know, red ear, brim. Man, y'all, you've stumped me, Mac. I don't even know. See, a pillated woodpecker. woodpecker. <laughs> Just a woodpecker is all I've heard them called. I mean, I don't think it is. The only thing I can think of is yellow hammer. Can well, I? That, that's a, that is a woodpecker. Yes. Called, you call it a yellow hammer. Isn't that a smaller one? It, it is, yeah. <laughs> Mac, why don't you text him and we, we can help him through here. But there, there is some common, there is a, like a, an old school way of referring to the pileated well, just woodpecker. Just say what is it? I know what it is. Go ahead. Lord God. No, that's the ivory build. No, no, a Lord God. It makes that crazy noise and it scares you. Lord God. Well, well, you hear it. So yeah. a jackhammer, <laughs> uh, a carpenter bird. The most popular one, though, is Indian hen. I have never heard any of these. None of y'all. I'm with you a thousand percent. <laughs> y'all have never heard it referred to as an Indian hen? Nope. No. 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 Dave, you've picked the worst question ever. <laughs> an, uh, an Indian hen is when you're turkey hunting on the reservations out there. <laughs> like, all these people in here have never heard of this. I, okay. Well, if you Google it, it'll, if you Google what is another name for a pileated woodpecker. What about you, Mac? I mean, if, <laughs> I, I didn't know the question until Bobby handed me the paper. <laughs> <laughs> that, was really, that was really mean. Bobby. I think I Dave wait, gets a redemption. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't, ha- I don't have a redemption question. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Dave. I didn't mean to stump you. I thought uh, you, stumped you stumped me. all of us. You yeah. stumped all of us. <laughs> <laughs> that was a stumper, Mac. An uh, Indian hen. Yeah. Google it, and that's what comes up. Yeah. You know, maybe we need Mac to start texting the answers to these trivia questions. Yeah, right? but, that was, I mean, I, I was, was over here. That was so I, mean. I, I can't know. believe you did that. And I was like, I'm going to get this common name. I know the common. I, don't know. I couldn't think of anything but Yellow Hammer. Bob Dixon used to call him a Guatemati. <laughs> Guatemati, what a bird. <laughs> what a woodpecker. Oh, Bob. So, uh, you know, the the whole the word Penhody, uh, that, that is such a neat word. It's interesting how you gravitated to that word. And, and uh, it's – there's that – in Alabama, there's the Penhody Trail. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, so I kind of grew up knowing about yeah. that. I'm, I'm wondering, is that kind of where you – picked up yeah on. for sure see i where i'm at here in cedar town we have you know we're jumping right on the alabama line and we have the national forest that runs up through here Pinhody trail kind of runs through town oh, so i oh, was wow I've, I've been i've turkey hunted up and down the Pinhody trail my whole life like that's kind of down home for me mm-hmm. so um when it come time to make a meaning for this thing and kind of put a title to it um it just kind of all fell into place yeah, uh, it's kind of had some that's, kind of some some down home that's home. way better than the chickasaw word for uh turkey I don't know if we can put this on air, but it's a. Oh really? <laughs> I tell you what, I've, I've used that word on a couple was, times. I can, I, I, was, sure. I, was I can answer to, that question. We can definitely not put it on air. I was getting a, a, a custom recurve made about 15 years ago, right. and I said, Brad, you know what's the word for turkey killer? I want to get this put on my recurve. Yeah. And he's like. 
<laughs> and uh, I said, what about, why don't we just change it to deer killer? And yeah. he, like, that's, that's Issa Tubby. So that's my bow is Issa Tubby now. Hmm. Interesting. Well, shock value. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... <laughs> It, what, it's not a bad it's not a bad word in the Chickasaw no, language. Right. It's just a label. You I guess it's what I guess what turkey hunters label. always they get frustrated and say, oh, I'm out of here and they yeah. say <laughs> Pinhody. That's a great that's a great because it I mean, it makes people wonder what that is and if they look it up. Yeah, it's cool. Yep. It it really does. But it but I guess they have to look up that creek meaning. That creek Yeah, we tried to spread that around as soon as we started decided that's what we were gonna call this thing. So we uh that's kind of what's on the little banner of the YouTube thing and stuff was kind of, so it wouldn't be quite as foreign to people, but right. when we came up with it, I thought, well, if people, if we get this thing popular enough to where people start Googling it, then we're kind of going to be standing by ourselves, you know, it, it'll be mm -hmm. kind of easy to find us if they know what to, to type in. So yeah, um, it it's kind of worked out. <laughs> yeah. Very. Yeah. It's, cool. it's amazing when you look at a map for really from coast to coast, how many Indian words are sure. oh. are just normalized? Oh, yeah. oh Mississippi, it, absolutely, <laughs> and deserving. Maybe should be more, but yeah. Yeah. You know, I've looked at trying to name things before, and you could. There's the there's dictionary for there's a Chickasaw dictionary, yeah. a Choctaw mm -hmm. dictionary. I mean, all the Cherokee dictionary. There's all the different. You can look stuff up. So hey, you know, one of the we talk. We're all over the board today, like we yeah, always are. But I think most people just love to listen to. Like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, right, give me 100%. that. But I got to ask this one. So situation, real quick, situation where two turkeys are gobbling mm. and they're cutting each other on the limb. If you found, if you can get between them, it makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've, I've played one turkey off of another. I've intentionally went into those situations and called, say, I'll get closer to one turkey and I'll call to the farther bird. Yep. And I think that that provokes a jealousy mm. thing. Um when that turkey gobbles, I'll, I'll provoke him and I'll, I'll yelp back at his gobble and almost attempt to ignore the bird that's closest to me. Um, mm -hmm. We've had that work multiple, multiple times. That's that's kind of an old an old tactic that I yep. love to lean on. Bird Especially back. later in the season, too. If they're cutting each other on the limb, if you can get there without spooking them, that's, you can just about go sit there and sit there and you'll kill one of them. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. something that I, you know, and that's, I've look. I, I promise you, I've sat with Lanny before, mm -hmm. and, and in a situation like that, and he'll be facing this way, and then all of a sudden he'll you'll, he'll be turned around, and he'll be like, "Which direction do I?" And I mean, <laughs> I've, I've seen him like panic. It usually works out though. It mm -hmm. has worked out, yeah. <laughs> but it, it can be because one, the uh, it seems like always you're set up on this one, and the one behind you yeah, will all of a sudden up. sound closer and you'll turn around yeah. and then the other one sounds closer. Yeah. And Dave, I think they'd have a pretty good reality show just showing them hunting together. Nothing might ever die, but the, yeah, it's <laughs> the way they're at each other, they're at each yeah. other's throat constantly. Entertainment. Yeah. It's I don't know, fun. I don't know yeah. about each other's throat, but yeah. kind of. Yeah. That's Dave, look, man, we have just been so impressed with you and your career and, and, and watching your, uh, the Penhody project, it, it's just a breath of fresh air. It is. You and do it's things someone, right. Yeah, yeah, and he's just being himself, which is what I think the enormous the popularity on top of his skill is that he they really feel like they jumped in the coat, you know, his coat pocket and got to travel with him. Yeah. And it's really special. And, you know, because we can think back to when you first started on a wing and a prayer and then here you are today. So everybody here is so proud and feels a part of it with you. And I think you know that. Yeah, don't change a thing. No. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all the uh, all the compliments, and obviously Mossy Oak's been a, a huge part of that from the get go. Um, and so I can't thank you guys there at Mossy Oak enough. And um, yeah, we're just uh, we're just taking a swing at this thing. Everybody, I don't know if there's a playbook. If there is, I haven't found it yet. So we're no. just kind of <laughs> riding by our sh shirt tails, you know, or you know, just trying <laughs> trying to get by. So we're just trying to uh, kind of do a lot of the same thing. Just kind of like you said, put people in our shirt pocket, kind of put people in our mind, tell them what we're thinking. Um, and just motivate people to like, Hey, uh, I just heard as I was coming up, like, uh, one day when I retire and one day when I do this one day, and I'm like, look, that man, one day's right now. Like, yeah, absolutely. Go Living in the moment. West, if you want to go hunt a Miriam Turkey, if you want to go hunt an Osceola Turkey, like we are not promised tomorrow, like, you know, do what it takes. The thing about Turkey hunting to me that I love it so much, it's not that expensive. Like you can set back a couple, you know, a few hundred bucks, four or 500 bucks, and you can usually go somewhere else in turkey hunt it's not you know it's there's not a um 
$1,200 tag or, you know, something like that, that really can be a um, deterrent. I mean, you can usually um, go turkey hunting for pretty relatively inexpensive. So I, you know, when people are, or always, you know, when I retire, well, one day I'm going to do that. I'm like, look, just do it. You'll be glad you did. Mm, that's good Not advice. to mention one of the top things you can do for conservation is just go buy a hunt license. Yeah, Even license. if you don't hunt, go buy a hunt license. Or, it, a, or a turkey stamp. Mm-hmm. That's right. Go. Or a turkey stamp, 100%. Mm-hmm. So yeah. where, how are you going to kick off this year? You got, you got. I guarantee you he's going to be on South Florida yeah. in a week or two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll be down in South. I think I'm leaving down there for about the 20th. Uh, so here in another, what, two wow. weeks. Yeah. Um, we'll be down there. We've got a youth hunter down there, and, and we'll be hunting South Florida that last weekend in February as always. So nice. looking forward to that. Incredible. Yeah, here we yeah. go. Back there, down there where they have the daggers way south is, man, they have some spurs down. Oh, yeah, just bl- like Blade. skinny as a pencil. But, I mean, just they have the longest spurs of any turkeys in the country, I think. Don't they? I, th- I, I think the record may be held by an eastern. But, yeah, it's just the Osceola. It's just that – that sandy soil just seems to yep. seems to groom those shirt spurs to a point that you just don't see anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Not to mention a lot of those jokers are pitch black and they just mm-hmm. and not to mention they're also on skinnier legs. Those osceolas mm-hmm. just have skinnier legs yep. overall. So even you know an inch and a half spur on a skinny leg turkey show looks big and nasty. Yeah, so. it does. Yeah. yeah. Look at Richie woke up. Yeah, there you go. I, like, oh, you know, we got to, we'll have to cut it off because we talk to him all day. I am, I could, I am so fired up. You know, you have, when you get him, it's like, I, I, I've, I've experienced this. What do you think? You know, it's just so nice to bounce it off someone that has so much experience yeah, with things. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I, I, we're just so impressed. We've been, oh, yeah. We really have enjoyed watching you. And, and like I said, I'll say it again, just the way you handle yourself and the, the people you're inspiring, it's just, it's, you're doing it right. Yep. Keep leading by example. Yeah, y'all yeah, tune well, in. He's got a that. lot of ways to consume what he does. Yeah. Um, tell us real quick, what do you, what would you recommend? Because there's so many people that are so th- thirsty to learn more and more and more. And I, no matter how long you've been hunting, that's right. Tell them how to follow what you, what all you're doing. Yeah, um, obviously, but as far as the streaming, like the videos, the long form stuff is going to be YouTube and Mossy Oak Go. Um, so that's the two places you can find it. That's awesome. And obviously, we're on the social media platforms like everybody else. And I'm trying to do more. Everybody is always thirsty for instructional stuff like that. Yes. And I, when I started this thing, I started doing like reworked episodes or the, uh, what did I call them? I call them reworked and, and takeaways. Like we're, we would go into a hunt and people had questions about the hunt. So we would kind of pick it apart. Um, and that's always been my uh, intention was to do a lot more of that stuff. But what I have found myself, the issue that I have ran into is I just have so doggone much footage of just hunting to get through and cleaned up. Um, by the time I get done with it, like I'm on, I'm editing June 1st right now. So I've got three more days of hunting to edit. And I mean, I'm fixing to kick off again. So wow, the time to do that instructional stuff is almost going to have to be on the fly. Yeah, But right. the way media is being consumed now with the short form video and the reels and all that kind of stuff, I think that's going to open up, um, avenues to do more of that instructional stuff kind of short form and not have to be so polished and cleaned up and, mm-hmm. and stuff so i'm thinking that's going to be my vessel to to get more of that type of stuff out there so awesome um We'd love to but the long it. form is definitely the the mossy oak go and and um and youtube is the two places you can find the the per let, day let stuff me tell you we're so go. honored to host you i mean we are so honored so yeah i i, I encourage everybody to watch it it's just so real i mean it's just like it is you don't reality tv for turkey hunters that's the best yeah well we're thrilled to have you here on the podcast this is long overdue and uh i'm gonna blame it on dudley for yeah. the fact that we <laughs> um, there, yeah. blame and, it on uh, no blame it on cuz he's not even here i guess by the time let's this blame, it on you, yeah, let's blame it on cuz <laughs> absolutely like blaming things on cuz <laughs> especially <laughs> in turkey season uh, yeah we'll blame it on cuz hopefully we'll see you at the convention in a oh, week i will. guess by the time this airs uh we'll we'll be there but uh bobby did extend the invitation for you to uh stay in his room if you need a place to stay so. <laughs> yeah, i don't even have a room that is, uh, <laughs> but yeah this will air uh, right before the convention yeah. convention mm-hmm. so uh we'll look forward okay, to seeing everybody yeah. Hope everybody that turkey hunts will come to it. It's a great yeah. celebration. It, it is, is a fantastic time to 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 be amongst like minded individuals. It's it a good you know, place to rub is, elbows there. It is yeah, clearly the most fun show we do anywhere. Yep. Yep. So, I really, really enjoy that. It's our 
Well, guys, is there anything? Uh, that, that, that yeah, that that all day long, but we got to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, hey, uh, number one Archie fan, that there's a jackhammer pileated wood pecker call we'll be sending to you even though <laughs> dave, dave, if you would go on your social media at your leisure he, he's he's so defensive dave i apologize and, for him and just ask your guy hey what's another uh, term for a pileated woodpecker I i'll bet ask him if they've ever say. heard of it called a jackhammer yeah. or, or an indian hen that's really what indian hen to, or a lord god you keep discounting uh, that's the what, ivory. what i grew up calling it an ivory build woodpecker has been extinct for so long so the good god is what they call hey, the pileated and the Lord God was the ivory built. There okay. you go. Drive us some knowledge. So, I am a Peckerwood knowledgeable guy. So. <laughs> it's a common name. It's whatever you want to call it. <laughs> All right, Richard. You, you have to say all that. Call, it, boy, call him Bob if I want to. Boy, did we digress. Yeah, yeah. we have. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, thank you so yeah, much for, for being, being here. here. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I sure appreciate the opportunity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I well, hope we get to see a sunrise together. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yes, sir. All right. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Richie. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.